Hello, and welcome to the Far Bank Fly Fishing School. I'm your host, Simon Gorsworth, and in this episode, we're going to look at perhaps the most tricky thing for fly fishers to master, the basic fly cast. Before we look at fly casting itself, let's be safe especially if you're a beginning fly caster or you're teaching somebody to fly cast, the line is out of control, they're gonna hit somebody or hook somebody and things can go really pear-shaped that quickly. So definitely, whenever you're fishing, always take with you and wear a pair of some kind of eye protection, sunglasses, they could be Polaroids, that does help you as a fisherman, but some kind of eye protection is really essential. Last thing you want is a hook in your eye, can't even think about that. Uh, and then on top of your head, just obviously stick some kind of hat on the end there, right? Just a little hat on there. So if you make a wayward cast, the fly snags you in your head, well, you just take your hat off and take the fly out of the hat. So those are a couple of good tips whenever you're fishing, whenever you're practicing casting is just be safe like that. And other ways you can be safe is tie on a little bit of yarn instead of a hook. There's a bit of pink yarn on there. If you tie that in the end of your leader, kind of like I've got here, you see, I've got a little bit of yarn tied on like that. That can hit anybody. Um, you know, if you imagine you've got a kid casting away and they just don't know and they do a back cast and hit somebody with this, hey, it's not going to be a problem. So yarn's a good option on the end of your line. But another thing you can do, and certainly if you get into fishing, this is really worthwhile doing because you're trying to catch some fish and maybe you want to be safe and maybe you want to put some fish back without harming them. One thing you can do is actually debarb a hook. Um, and, and so what I've got here is I've got a little fly and this is on a hook, and at the bottom hook on the inside, there's a little point thing facing the opposite direction to the point, and that's called a barb. The barb is what keeps it a secure grip when you hook a fish, kind of like a barb on a spear. The problem with a barb is if you hook yourself or a clothing, as I've got with this bit of cloth here, when you get it in, the barb stops it coming out. See, look at that, look how I can't get that out. So imagine that that's in your bit of skin and you're trying to tug away. So if you want to be particularly safe, one thing you can do when you're fishing is you can take a fly and you can take a pair of forceps, hemostats like this, and you can put the hemostats across the hook and squish the barb flat. And what I like to do is I like to just move it in three angles, 90 degrees and then about 45 degrees. And really all I'm trying to do is flatten the barb rather than break it off. And the advantage with doing that is really that when you put it into the cloth or you hook it into somebody's cheek by mistake, it goes in, comes straight back out again. In, straight back out. So that's one great tip. If you want to be safe out there, debarb your hook. Safety is important. Do remember that every time you're on the water, whether you're casting or you're fishing, remember to be safe because again, you don't want to hurt yourself or hurt anybody else by do, doing things incorrectly or accidentally hooking them. So that's it, that's our little safety spiel before we start the thing. Now, let's talk about fly fishing and how does fly fishing differ from conventional fishing? One of the biggest differences between fly fishing and spin fishing is the casting. Fly casting has casting. So there's a back cast and a forward cast when you're fly fishing. And in spin fishing, there is no back cast. You simply hold the spinning rod behind you, release the bail arm there, flip it forward, there's a forward stroke that propels the spinner or the bait or whatever it is out there. Whereas fly fishing, you have to have a back cast. So one essential difference is that. And another one is that generally in spin fishing, you've got the weight of a spinner or you've got some lead weight on there or you've got a bobber and that's the weight that makes the rod flex and, and pops it out to the fish. Now, if you take the spinning rod and you tie just the, a simple fly to it and then try and make a cast with the spinning rod and a fly on the end, it goes nowhere. Look at that mess. Fell at my feet because there's no way there's enough weight in a fly to make a spinning rod work. You've either got to add the weight or take up fly fishing. In fly fishing, the fly line's the weight. You tie your fly line on, you tie your leader on, you tie your fly to that leader, and the fly line is the weight that takes it out there. So those are really your essential differences between casting in spin fishing and casting in fly casting. Now, let's look at fly casting. Let's go down to the water and take a look at some of the more simple things like how do you stand and how do you hold the fly rod? Okay, so that's a subtle difference between fly fishing and spin fishing and why a fly line is important. So we're going to take a look at the basic cast here because obviously you've got to know how to cast your fly out there. It's a little more complicated than spin fishing as we talked about. And before we do any of that, we're going to talk about how you stand and how you hold the rod, what's called the grip. And to be honest, as a beginner, do what you like. Stand how you like, grip how you like. 
You do want to hold the fat piece. This is called the handle. You, that's a fairly obvious one. Not many people make the mistake of not hand, holding the handle. So do hold the handle. And generally speaking, you want to find where the rod balances. You see it balances right about here, top of my cork handle. So I like to hold the top of the grip. I think that balance is really essential for effortless casting. As you get into your casting, you're going to find a grip that is comfortable for you. And generally in fly casting, there's three grips. There's a thumb on top grip, there's the index finger on top grip, and there's what's called the handshake grip, where there's actually nothing on the top of the rod, and your thumb and index finger go either side of the cork handle. Play around with it. Try all three grips when you're casting. Find what's comfortable, find out what you can do a better casting stroke with. Let's not be dogmatic about this and say, this is the way. You'll find your way. And similar with the stance, when you, when you stand on the water, you can stand, if I'm a right-handed caster here, I can stand with my left foot forward, I can stand with my right foot forward, and I can stand square. And again, just play around, just try all three stances, make a few casts, find out what works for you, find out what feels comfortable, find out what keeps your balance and you fall in, just stuff like that, mess around with them. And then as you evolve in your casting, you're gonna find actually there's certain stances that are important. An obvious one is a distance. If I want to make a really long distance throw, I could take an analogy of picking up a rock off the ground here and, and giving it to anybody, seven year old kid, and say, throw this as far as you can. And the first thing they'll do with their right hand is they'll probably do this. And they'll come left foot forward. So when you're distance casting, you will get a better distance with your left foot forward for your right hand. That's called an open stance. And if you want to be really accurate, you're targeting a fish or you're making a cast at a specific thing, you're going to be much more accurate with a square stance like this and a much more upright casting stroke. But that's down the road, right? If you're learning this fly casting thing, just hold the rod comfortably. Hold the rod in, in such a tension that if your friend came along, he could pull it through and, and make it slide in your hands. A lot of people, when they start off, this whole thing are really tense and they hold this rod like death and the knuckles glow and pulse and the shoulders are tense. You cannot make a fluid casting stroke with tension like that. So hold the rod loosely, find the grip that works for you. You're gonna utilize this bit of fly line at some stage. At some stage you're gonna find a, you hold it in your left hand or you might hold it under your finger. Worry about that later. But right now, as a novice fly caster, just get comfortable with the grip, comfortable with your stance, and then we're gonna start talking about fly casting itself. Just before we take a look at casting, I want to go back to stance for one more thing. I just want to make sure you understand that fly casting can be dangerous, right? There's hooks on the end, the hooks are flying all over yourself. So no matter how good your buddy is as a mate, don't stand so close to him that you could get hooked by him, right? This would be far too close a position for me to start casting. I would go at least 30, 40 feet away so I don't get caught on his back cast. And on a similar context, if I want to walk past him to go to a different fishing spot, he might not know I'm here because he's concentrating on fishing. So just let him know. Hey, Nick, I'm just going to walk past you. Can you pause for a sec? And then once you've let him know, you can walk past, get fishing, let him know you've passed. And that way you don't get hooked. Pretty important when fly fishing. So that's how you stand and how you grip. Now it's pretty casual. There's no real laws about this yet. But above all, again, remember that safety thing, the etiquette. Remember to make sure that your buddy knows you're going to be walking behind him if you're casting, because again, a day could be ruined by that. Now, now we've got a thing called a loop lab. A loop lab, well, let's just check it out. Let's go down to our loop lab and look at fly casting in its essence. How do you make a fly cast? <music> Okay, so we've now come down to our loop lab to talk about fly casting itself. We're going to look at just fly casting. And fly casting actually has two casts. There's a thing that goes behind you, that's called the back cast. There's a thing that goes in front of you, that's called the forward cast. And they're kind of mirror images of each other. And what do you kind of understand as you go through fly casting is there's two components to each stroke. What's called translation, what's called rotation. And let me just show you what that is. Really simple. Translation is where your rod moves without rotation. Rotation is obviously rotation. So a casting stroke has its translation to rotation forward, and then a mat cast has the similar thing, translation to rotation. Translation to rotation. That's a casting stroke. And a really good analogy. Think of a ball in a bucket. You're trying to pitch a ball into a bucket. If the bucket's 10 feet away, you might do a little underhand lob and just flip it in there because it's so close. 
But if that bucket's 20 feet away or 50 feet or 60 feet away, you're going to have a longer throw. And casting's kind of the same. Casting, if I have a long cast, I'm going to make a real long translation before rotation. And on the forward stroke, the long translation to the rotation. That's what gives me the distance. And if you don't need distance, you have a short translation to rotation. And one of the cruxes of casting is what we call the SSFF, start slow, finish fast. So a good casting stroke has a nice slow start, accelerating to a fast rotation. And on a forward stroke, just kind of the mirror image, it's a slow start forward to a fast acceleration on the rotation. And that's what good casting is. And we can see Tegan's here throwing these beautiful loops. He's got this slow start with this fast acceleration. The rod rotates over, it kicks the line behind him. That's a perfect back cast. And as he drives forward, he starts slowly and accelerates with this lovely rotation and kicks the line in front. That's great casting style. And what you're doing when you're creating these good casting strokes is you're forming a thing called a loop. And the simplest way, kind of another analogy that's really good for fly casting is to think of a piece of paper. Imagine throwing a piece of paper into the waste bin. If you threw it as a whole sheet of paper, it's going to float around and dribble and go nowhere. So anybody would scrumple it up into a paper ball and throw that into the bin. And what, all you're doing with that is you're reducing the air resistance of that piece of paper. And in fly casting, the same effect happens. And that's what's called a loop. Let's take a look at some loops. <laughs> So what exactly is a loop? Well, a loop is the shape your fly line takes when you've made these casting strokes. You have a front loop and a back loop, like you have a front stroke and a, fore and a back stroke. And a loop really is a, an elongated horizontal U shape. And they vary. You can have a narrow loop where the gap between the top and the bottom of the loop is slim, or you can have a big, huge loop where the gap between the top and the bottom of the loop is enormous. You could drive a bus through it. Huge, great thing. And the problem with the bad loops, big loops, is there's a lot of air resistance. Go back to that piece of paper. You're trying to throw a piece of paper into the rubbish bin that's unfolded or uncrumpled. There's a huge amount of air resistance. And that air resistance is an enormous factor on casting as well. So generally speaking, as you fly cast, you're trying to form these tight loops. Now, how you form a tight loop? Well, that is all dependent on what you're doing with the top of your fly rod. A small loop has generally a horizontal path where the height really doesn't change much between the back and the forward stroke, between the translation and the rotation. The straighter that rod path is, the tighter the loop will be. What a bad casting stroke is where there's much more of a rotating arc. The rod, more the rod arcs, the wider the loop will be, the more air resistance, and what that means is the loop doesn't go as far, there's too much air resistance. And what a loop should do when you're casting is unroll and land in a beautiful straight line. And if the loop is too big, then what happens is that the line doesn't go as far and you get poor turnover. Turnover is what the term is for your line unrolling. So you're trying to form nice tight loops and you'll get there. Through practice, you'll get there, trying to eliminate the rotating part of the casting stroke. Now, one other bad loop to avoid on your forward cast or your back cast is what's called a tailing loop. And the tailing loop is an aggressive casting stroke generally. It's not a smooth acceleration. If you make a sharp, snatchy move, you'll get a tailing loop. Tailing loops are very easy to recognize. And the end result of a tailing loop, well, that's generally something called a wind knot, a knot that you tie into your line while you're casting. Sounds magical. It's actually a terrible thing because what happens is that knot weakens your line. And if you hook the fish of a lifetime, it's going to snap off and all because you had a tailing loop. So keep your casting stroke smooth, start slow, finish fast, have that nice rotation at the end of your stroke. And remember to try and track your rod on a fairly straight path back and forward and not arc it too much. So loops are a very important, highly technical part of casting that really do benefit. You. So focus on your loops and practice hard to get good loops on both back and forward cast. One other significant thing about loops is that there's a timing. When you cast, you have to have a good timing to make a good cast. And as you watch a loop unroll, what you'll see is it'll unroll until it is completely straight if you've done a good cast. And then when it's completely straight, you should start the next casting stroke. That is perfect timing. You can go forward too early or you can go forward too late. And certainly as a beginner, you're going to find that you need a little bit of practice to get used to your timing. A couple of telltale signs, though. 
If you go forward too late, what happens is your line fully unrolls, and instead of going forward, you might wait fractionally too long. Gravity comes into play, pulls the line down towards the grass or the water, and you'll snag the grass or you'll hit the water, whatever's behind you. So that's a really good sign that you're waiting too long. Is it going to frequently hit the grass? And that gets so frustrating because you're either going to lose your fly or you're going to have to walk back and unhook your fly from the grass. If you go forward too soon, your loop is still unrolling as you start the forward stroke. And what happens is the two forces of the loop unrolling one way and your forward stroke going the opposite way makes the line turn over with incredible speed. And it makes a crack. It actually cracks. It's like you're taking a wet tea towel and whacking your buddies on the thigh with that crack noise. That's what happens if you actually make your timing and go forward before the line is completely unrolled. Now that crack will crack your fly off. You've got a fly on and you hear that crack. Well, goodbye fly, you just lost it. And really one very good tip I can give you for practicing your casting is practice your casting with no fly on the end. Because if you do that and you time it right, every time you make your stroke when the line is dead straight, it'll move silently through the air. But if you go forward when there's a slight part of the loop, it will turn over with speed and crack and make that hot, loud noise. And it tells everybody you've got bad timing. So that's the timing of casting, all related to your loop. But what is also related to is how much line you've got. Because let's say you had a loop that was only 10 feet long and you make a back cast, it only takes a short amount of time for that 10 feet of line to unroll, and then you make your next cast and so on and so forth. Now, if you have 50 feet of line, it's going to take a lot longer for that line to completely unroll, and therefore you need a longer stroke and a longer pause. So things change as you evolve. And it gets a little bit more difficult as you're practicing at the beginning with different length of the lines, but I'm just letting you know that when you're casting, you're not going to have a set rhythm for every cast. You just want to build up a rhythm, and as your line gets longer, your stroke gets longer, as we talked about just now, but also your timing gets longer, your pause between the two casts. And so that is a very important thing to practice. Make sure you get good timing by practicing your casting. And once you've got your cast timing going down, you want to get down to the water and start actually mastering the casts themselves. <laughs> So what do you think? That's the loop lab, isn't that gorgeous? How you can see a fly line so clearly, how you see a line unroll, all about those beautiful loops, the big loops that are horrible, the tailing loops that crash and die, and of course those beautiful sexy little loops that are perfect for fly casting. Now, now you understand those basics of casting stroke and what loops are, let's take it the next step and learn the essential fly cast themselves. And to do that, we're gonna head down to the Yellowstone River and show you the pick up and lay down cast. All right, so that's a plenty of theory there. Now let's go and talk about and show you some of the casts, some of the basic casts as a novice fly caster that you should be practicing and learning to get to be a good fly caster. We've got Carly here and she's gonna show us a few things about the cast. And the first thing we're gonna look at is what's called the pick up and lay down cast. And it's just a very easy cast. It's named that way because what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick the line up, make a back cast and lay the line down. And if you recall, we've talked about timing, so it's important to get the timing right on these casts and understand a little bit about loops. Now you've got that theory, let's see what we're gonna do with the cast. And the pick up and lay down cast is best practiced in a river, if you can, with a river flowing downstream. You want to face downstream in the river rather than across the river. And that means your line will always start off tight rather than a little bit of slack. And that makes things a lot easier when you start with a tight line. The pick up and lay down cast always starts with a low rod, close to the water. Your grip and stance, as we discussed, is comfortable. Stand how you like, hold it how you like at this stage of the game, just be comfortable. And then you're gonna make this cast called the back cast, and it starts off with a very slow, smooth lift, accelerates into a kick, forms a back loop behind you, you time your cast right, when the line unrolls, you make your forward cast. And the essence of these casts is always this start slow, finish fast that we talked about. Nice, smooth casting stroke on the back and a nice, smooth casting stroke on the forward. And one very important tip is have a listen to how the line lifts off the water. When you make a back cast, you should hear nothing. That line should lift off the water silently. And you can always get that, as you can hear here, with a slow lift and a quick back stroke. If you make a quick lift, you get this spray noise, this big, spray noise and a lot of beginners start too hastily so listen to your line leaving the water and hear how it leaves the water it should leave quietly then you have your acceleration make your back cast make your forward cast the exact opposite of your back cast start slow finish fast 
lay it down. And that's a pick up and lay down cast. Once you've got the hang of this pick up and lay down cast and you're starting to get a bit of a rhythm and it feels nice and you're getting some straight casts out there, you've got to evolve. Everything evolves, everything means you're going to get a little bit better and better and so things get a little bit more difficult. And the next thing we're going to talk about is what's called false casting. You can see Carly here false casting away. False casting is literally where your line is going back and forth several times. You don't do just one cast, you do several casts and then you lay that cast down. Now the reason you would false cast, well there's a number of reasons. In fishing situations you're going to false cast because you might have a fly called a dry fly on. A dry fly floats on the water, after a bit of time that wet, that fly gets wet and sinks and you have to dry it off. So false casting is a great way of drying the fly out, the feathers. You're also going to find as you evolve that you're going to be pulling some line in and getting it further out again and you want to do that in several casts in the air. You want your line in the air false casting rather than hitting the water every single time. So again that's another good thing you'll come across is that false casting to get a longer line. But really at the beginning stage of things false casting is probably the best way of getting a rhythm to your cast or probably the quickest way to get a rhythm. If you pick up and you lay down, you could stop, you've lost the rhythm, you could start again, it's a bit erratic, a bit sporadic. So false casting is a great way of building up a rhythm in your casting stroke. You just practice and you'll find the first couple might be just terrible and out of control and gradually keep it going. Gradually you'll find you'll get control or you might lose control totally, in which case you just stop and start again. Now because the false cast means that the line should be in the air, in front of you and behind you, what that means is you're going to have to stop the rod in a high position, there's a clock face and you imagine a clock face, the rod stops at an angle about one o'clock and on the forward stroke the rod is going to stop at an angle of about eleven o'clock and whilst you're false casting, all the time you're false casting, that rod should go between one and eleven and one and eleven one and eleven and as long as you're doing that that rod will keep up high it'll keep the line in the air for the whole scene and then when you're ready for that final cast that one to eleven goes one to ten and then down to the water that's the last cast that lays it down as we talked about earlier the timing is really important you've got to make sure you have the right timing between your back cast and your forward cast they've got to unroll so get your nice time and make sure you're starting to form those nice little loops and you're going to do that with that 1 to 11. And a really good tip is practice this thing over water. Because if you're standing in water and if you go back too far or if you have too slow a cast, you'll find the line will hit the water behind you and you'll see the splash. Or you'll see the splash in front of you. So by practicing in water you can see that. 1 to 11, get a nice casting stroke, get a good rhythm, keep that slow start to fast finish get that rhythm going with your false casting and then when you're ready lay it down and that is the second thing to practice is false casting is a great rhythm builder great foundation creator so very very important as a novice caster to get into false casting once you've mastered your false casting then there's another step always another step there's always something to learn you can go the entire life casting learning casting and never even catch a fish and believe it or not, some people love casting and actually don't go fishing. That's actually true. So let's have a look at another step. Another step is what's called shooting the line. Now, as you become a fly fisherman rather than a fly caster, the, one of the things you're going to find that you do is you retrieve the line. You pull the fly towards you, trying to mimic whatever the fish is feeding on or whatever you think the fish is feeding it. So you're going to pull the line in with your non-dominant, your non-casting arm. And you're going to pull it in from your finger down and just strip the line in. But what that means is once you strip the line in, you've got to get it back out again. And the first step to learning how to get it back out again is to do what's called shooting line. Just the first step, there's two steps to it, but the first step is the shooting line. And for this exercise, what's, again, face down the river. And what you want to do here, as you can see, is you want to pull in the line until there's about two to three feet of line hanging down from your casting hand. The first thing you're going to do differently is now you're going to hold the line in your non-casting hand and keep that non-casting hand close to your casting hand. That's a very important part there. 
that non-casting hand should follow your casting hand. Now, you're going to make your false cast moves and just get your rhythm going again and just kind of feel really comfortable with that rhythm. And on the very last cast, what you're going to do is actually let the line go out of your non-dominant hand and it'll shoot up the rod and disappear. Gone. Much longer cast. Beautiful. If you're false casting good and you've got a rhythm of your false casting, you're comfortable with your false casting, this part isn't too tricky. The tricky part is what is the right time to let the line go? The answer to that question is you should let the line go as, and that's a very important word, as the rod stops on your final cast. So you're going to make your false cast, you get your rhythm going, and when you make your last cast, the moment the rod stops, you let go. That is the precise time to release the line. Now when you're learning this, you're going to let go a little bit too early, or you're going to let go a little bit too late, and you're going to have dire consequences. If you let go a little bit too early, what happens is the rod is still moving forward when you let go, and the line rushes up, the slack line you're shooting rushes up in a very fast speed, the rod is going to lose its tension, and the cast is probably going to fall in a mess. So don't release too early, don't release the line when your rod is moving. Equally, you could have quite a late reaction, and you can start your false casting, get it going, you've got this lovely false casting technique going here, as you can see, and then what happens is you can let, make the last cast, and then decide to let go, and the line isn't moving. And if the line isn't traveling in the air, it can't pull the slack line out. So that's the first thing, get used to the timing of releasing the line. That's just called shooting line. Now, as you get used to that timing, we've got to expand it a little bit further. We've always got to make things a little bit more complicated, take you down this casting path, make things a bit better for you. Because when you're fishing, you're actually going to be pulling the fly probably all the way back to you. You might make a 40-foot cast, so your fly is 40 feet out, and then you pull the fly till it's 10 feet away from you. And you're going to strip the line in until it's about 10 feet away from you, and then what you'll find is lying on the water underneath you is a puddle of slack, like 20 feet of line lying on the water. There's no way you can get rid of all that line in a single cast. And so what's going to happen is now, this next step is actually you want to let line go every forward cast with the right timing. So you start your false cast, just get your rhythm going. And once you've got your rhythm going, you feel that there's a nice timing, on your forward cast, release the line, and then grab it for the back. Release and grab for the back. Release, grab for the back. And you keep doing that, working out little bits of line each time until you've got about two to three feet left, and that's when you let your last cast go, and it's all gone. Now again, it's another step, right? So this step will take you a lot of time. You will lose your false casting rhythm. You will shoot line at the wrong time and have your rhythm out, but it's a vital step to going fishing. It's a vital step because so much of fishing is about pulling the line in. And if you've pulled it in, you have to get it back out again. So it's a really important step is this shooting line in the middle air, the false casting, the shooting line. One of the hardest parts for novice casters to get used to, however, is the rhythm. And the easiest way to understand that is when you start the cast, if you've only got 10 feet of line outside the rod, and you make a back cast, it doesn't take long for that 10 feet to unroll behind you. So you'll have a fairly quick rhythm between the back cast and the forward cast. So tick tock, tick tock, that kind of rhythm. Then you get a little bit longer line to 12 and to 14 feet and to 15 and to 18 feet and 20 feet. Now it's gonna take a little bit more time for that line to unroll behind you and in front of you. So you have to have a longer pause between each of those two strokes. And that really is a tough step, right? There's an awful lot buzzing around in your head. How, when, when should I let go of the line? I must stop my rod at one o'clock and 11 o'clock. I must hold the rod loosely. You've got to remember all that. And now I've got to change my rhythm? Yes, you do, because that's how you make a good cast. But it's just practice. Like all of these things, it's just practice. Keep on the water, keep practicing. And if you really want to get good at fly fishing, get good at fly casting. It's a hugely important step. So really, in the way of basic casting, you don't need to know much more than that. You don't need to know much more than laying it down, false casting, shooting some line, working line out. And though I say that, I, I'd like to just mention one thing, and that is kind of a realization that 
There's physics involved in casting. We keep talking about physics. It's a, such an important part about the casting. And the physics I want you to picture here is a great analogy, the bow and arrow, or a slingshot. Let's just talk about a bow and arrow. If you had a bow and an arrow and you're gonna draw and shoot and pull back, you're gonna pull the arrow back. And when you release, the arrow is gonna go directly opposite where you pulled it. And fly casting is very similar. With these previous exercises, what we've been doing is casting back and forward right opposite each other. But sometimes you have to change direction. Sometimes you have to cast your line. For example, in this situation, Carly's fishing downstream and sometimes you've got to cast across river. And what you can't do is do that in a single step. You have to do it in little bites. So you get your false cast rhythm going and you just change direction in small bites. Each time, just changing as you can see, round a bit more. And when your back cast is opposite your final forward cast, that's when you can lay it down and you'll get a successful cast. So it's much better to make small bites to change direction rather than try it in a single one angle change cast. And that is an awful lot to take in. You know, that's a lot of information in a short little clip of a video, but take it step by step. Do please work on step one and get a good rhythm on step one before you look at step two and step three and step four. And that way you'll become a much better caster with a much more ingrained muscle memory and a correct rhythm and timing. It's a long path to become a good caster. It's all about how much time you put on the water practicing and also understanding some of the things to do. And that's what we've done here. So fly casting is a beautiful skill that takes time to develop. It takes understanding of a couple of key things and it takes what's called muscle memory. You want to build up the right muscle memory to be a good caster. And you can certainly go outside and rig up your fly rod and practice your fly casting outside on the river, on the lake, on the grass, wherever. But sometimes you can't do that. Maybe it's winter, maybe you don't have anything nearby, maybe you're living in a housing block that has no grass or water around and you still want to develop your muscle memory. Well, you can do it indoors. There's a couple of great, great ways of practicing your fly casting indoors and building up your muscle memory and also understanding the rhythm, the timing of fly casting. I think the best way is to get an indoor fly casting rod. Yep, they make them and they're not toys. Plenty of great fly casters learn and practice this way. This is a rod called the form rod, ready to make this rod. And really it's just a short little rod, maybe four foot long with a handle on the end and a bunch of fly line threaded up and a big bit of yarn on the front end like that, which is what you're casting. And you've got to have a little bit of space in your house. So I'm going to step back a little bit, get a little bit of space and you can just practice the casting stroke like this indoors and watch the line. The one thing I like about the form rod is that I can watch the line. I can see the loop shapes. We've talked about loop shapes. I can see the line unroll and practice my timing. So that's why I like this kind of thing for practicing indoors. It comes with a lot of spare lines. So as you get bigger and bigger houses and more and more space, you can have a lot of line out there. And here we don't have the space, but I can just practice my casting. So that's one way of doing it. If you have less space, or you want to practice a different thing, not perhaps building muscle memory, but building the essence of a good cast. Start slow, finish fast, and also translation to rotation. You can practice that with even less space and no line on the rod by practicing with your ears. Let me show you. Here's my form rod. I pulled the line out. I'm going to make a good casting stroke, and if you listen, I'll shut up, it's pretty hard to do, but I'll shut up. If you listen to the rod whistle, you'll hear where it is. Good casting stroke, start slow, finish fast. Same on the forward stroke. Hear where the whistle is? There. There. Great casting stroke. Noise is at the end because I started slow, finished fast. Now let me do a bad one where I start fast. The noise instantly. There, and there, and there, and there, and there. Right, far too excessive noises in the wrong spot. So you want to start slow, keep the translation. Look how easy I can do this. No need any line, I can just practice this. There's the noise, drive forward, there's my translation. Flick, listen to the noise. All right, that's an excellent, an excellent practice, indoor practice. So practice with the line to get the timing, 
take the line off and practice just to listen to the noise to get the understanding of your start slow, finish fast, translation to rotation. Now, not everybody has an indoor casting rod. So if you don't have an indoor casting rod, there is still a way to practice, and that is that you just take the butt section of your rod and you put your reel on the rod and you do the same little exercise that I did just now. But instead of hearing the flick of the rod, you're actually going to hear the reel make a little noise. Here we go. Have a listen. There's a noise. There's a noise. All right? The inertia of my correct flick has made the reel spin. There. There. If you do it wrong, no noise. There's no flick. There's no start, slow, finish, fast. This is one pace. So you can practice indoors with just the butt section, practicing the noise of the reel spinning. I think that's a good way of getting hang of the translation and rotation, and also getting the slow start to the fast finish. But I really think that threading up with an indoor casting rod like that form is a better tool because now you can also add the timing of the loop unroll as well as looking at the loop shape. Is it big? Is it small? Is it tailing? None of that you can do without that line on there. So really, there's a couple of ways of looking at fly casting. You can do it outside. I certainly recommend going outside and practicing fly casting outside, of course. But if you don't want to do that, or if you just want to become better and better and practice it indoors and just get your muscle memory and your rhythm timing, your start slow, your finish fast, and your translation and rotation going, you can equally do that inside. So there you have it the basic tools and the knowledge and the cast you need to learn all you need to do for a beginning fly caster. I hope you enjoyed this episode, hope you learned a few things from it, and if you did, look out for our next episode, which is all about basic river fly fishing tactics. As always, when you're out there on the water, remember, respect the environment, leave no trace of where you've been, and look after those beautiful wild creatures or even those beautiful stockfish. Whatever you're catching, look after them. They're so precious to us as fly fishermen. Thanks a lot for watching. See you out there.